Thank you very much, Stefano. So it's a great pleasure to, to stay here to moderate uh, this incredible panel. I do believe it's a great option for the entire audience uh, to use the two guest speakers to interact with them within the Q&A session. Uh, I have the task to, to introduce this very uh, relevant and controversial topic because we have to debate about uh, the dilemma between uh, austerity and expansion, but in the same time we are debating a bit probably about the future of the European Union. I want to say a couple of words. First of all, it's a controversial aspect. That means it's a dilemma. Today we have to debate about uh, different angles we can use to see how does it work, how is it possible to solve this dilemma. Probably a suggestion could be, and we have to debate about it to modify also at the institutional level, the architecture of European Union is one of the issues uh, within the debate. The second aspect uh, is related to the fact that when we debate about uh, our future, it's not just simply an internal debate. Uh, Europe has got to compete with other platforms all around the world. Competition is today a competition between different platforms. So the US platform, the Russian platform, the Chinese platform, the Indian platform, we are here in London, which is the country and the city of asset allocation. That means the way in which we are going to solve this dilemma will be absolutely relevant to attract or not to attract flows of investment coming from outside and very relevant to sustain growth. The last aspect to start the debate, uh, I want to come back to the past and I want to use a sort of sentence uh, that in my opinion sounds absolutely modern and inspiring today. It's a sentence of uh, Jacques Delors, uh, that means one of the Nobel father of uh, European uh, Union. And Jacques Delors said that uh, in a certain sense, European Union, sorry, the European community at that time, uh, was made by three different layers, three different levels. So the level of policymakers, uh, the level of corporations and financial institutions, uh, and third, the level of citizens and society. And in a certain sense, the responsibility of European Union is to try to keep all these pieces all, all together. Probably one solution within the dilemma is exactly related to this aspect, which is uh, really fundamental, in my opinion, sometimes we, we forget. Uh, however, I think we can start so with the speaker. So I would like to start with, uh, with, with Guido and <laughs> In a, certain sense of the, in a certain sense, the first question uh, is strictly related to, to the topic. Uh, is there really a dilemma, a trade-off between uh, austerity and expansion, Guido? Thank you. Uh, let me just start by thanking once more the organizers, and if I may also congratulate uh, uh, Bruno and Andrea. I was really impressed uh, and touched by their presentations, and it's a sign of how dynamic our institution is to see how it has changed so rapidly and keeps changing. Back to your question uh, and to the title of the session. I think it's important when we discuss this trade-off between austerity and growth to distinguish between the national and the EU level. Uh, because at, at the national level, of course, inevitably there is such a trade-off uh, there was such a trade-off in the sense that we were hit by a sudden stop and when a nation is hit by a sudden stop and the sovereign debt crisis, it has no alternative but to engage in, in fiscal austerity to restrict the budget. Um, of course, it should not overdo this and perhaps in some cases, I'm thinking of Greece, maybe it was overdone. If you overdo it, uh, then uh, you the economy sinks so low that uh, you may even prejudice the goal of stabilizing uh, the budget, uh, particularly in the long run, still thinking about uh, the national level. Uh, if the economy is very depressed uh, and uh, growth collapses uh, and becomes very negative, uh, it's likely that the loss of output is going to be persistent. Uh, there's going to be what economists call hysteresis. There's going to be a permanent reduction in productive capacity. And this may make uh, the task of uh, stabilizing debt in the very long run harder uh, compared to a policy which prevents this collapse in the economy. So um, 
uh, with exceptions, and you should not overdo it, but at the national level it's clear uh, that there is this trade-off and we have to find the optimal point and maybe in some cases it was not found. Uh, at the, the euro area level, however, uh, there is no such to draw trade-off in the current circumstances. The sudden stop concerned one part of the euro area, not the euro area as a whole, uh, and the appropriate policy at the level of the euro area is to boost aggregate demand and to grow as much as possible at an, at an aggregate level to facilitate uh, meeting the challenge of, uh, uh, of the sovereign debt crisis. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, uh, this was not done in retrospect, and according to many economists also looking uh, at, as events were unfolding. And it was not done, I think, uh, to keep up aggregate demand for, uh, in, in both with regard to monetary policy and, and, and fiscal policy. QE came too late, uh, and uh, fiscal policy at the aggregate European level was too restrictive because the unavoidable restriction in Southern Europe was not accompanied by uh, some kind of expansion in uh, Northern Europe. Uh, so I think there was a big mismanagement of aggregate demand at the Euro area level which worsened the trade-off between austerity and growth uh, in the part of the Euro area that was hit by the crisis. Uh, I, was I think this is probably well understood by many economists, by most economists, I would say, and, and most people uh, who operate in, uh, in, the, in, the, in the financial industry. I was struck in this regard uh, in reading the recent uh, report of the four presidents, the analytical note. It's not yet the final report of the four presidents of uh, uh, the Commission, the European Union, the Eurogroup, and the ECB that was uh, just presented uh, in February at one of the uh, summit meetings. Uh, this report lists very carefully the causes of uh, the crisis, and it goes at great length in indicating how there were national responsibilities and the countries left, let uh, their countries to be too vulnerable. But there was no mention at all in this report uh, of the aggregate demand mismanagement at the euro area level as a whole. On the contrary, uh, there was a, an implicit hint that fiscal policy was too restrictive uh, during this, uh, sorry, too, too lax, not too restrictive, it was too lax during the management of the crisis. Uh, and so I think the opposite is true, uh, and it's worrying that there is a taboo in the euro area that doesn't acknowledge the fact that we have a problem of uh, aggregate demand uh, uh, management. Uh, of course, monetary policy is now doing its part, but maybe we will return to this. It is dangerous to overburden monetary policy with QE, uh, and we should acknowledge that fiscal policy should do a greater part to improve this uh, trade-off between austerity and growth. And I find it worrying that uh, this four-president report uh, does not even acknowledge the issue. Okay, thank you. Annie, on the same question, I do believe okay. that. Thank you very much, and I, I would also like to uh, thank uh, uh, Bruni as alumni for inviting me. I'm very honored because I have uh, no background in Bocconi. I'm just an external uh, uh, observer of uh, this very uh, uh, amazing uh, university. So I would uh, so so thank you again for, for inviting me. And uh, so I, I agree that there has been a mismanagement of aggregate demand. Nevertheless, I will start with supply side, where it is true that uh, among experts in, in the European Union, you have those who only believe in supply and those who only believe in, uh, in the aggregate demand side. So um, I think the title of this session is, is very appropriate in this sense. Uh, those who believe in supply think that uh, growth will be restarted <coughs> based on only structural reforms. And then you have those who say, who argue that structural reforms have a negative impact on aggregate demand in the short term. So therefore, you should wait until you uh, perform uh, uh, 
structural reforms. And I think this is really uh, not appropriate. Many structural reforms actually don't have a negative impact on demand in the short term. Of course, if you think about reforms of the labor market, if you, if you cut unemployment benefits in the short term, you have a negative impact on aggregate demand. But many uh, structural reforms do have a positive impact on, uh, on aggregate demand. If you think, well, in, in France, uh, uh, a law is uh, being passed, uh, hopefully, uh, to liberalize some uh, protected sectors, uh, for instance, uh, trans ground transportation for, for passengers. And this uh, could have a positive impact on purchasing power, therefore on aggregate demand and create jobs. So uh, I think we, we should be very careful in, within structural reforms to distinguish those who, which can have a negative impact in the short term on aggregate demand and those who could even have a positive impact on aggregate demand. And, um, uh, the debate on QE also, uh, there are some people arguing that QE will reduce the incentive for national governments to perform structural reforms, and I think this is not true. Uh, there could be a negative impact on fiscal adjustments, for sure. But on structural reforms, I don't think so, because uh, many structural reforms do have a negative impact on the price levels. So uh, people say, people argue that uh, this is not the correct uh, time to uh, go for structural reforms because we already have uh, not deflation, but close to deflation. And uh, I think the QE should be a positive incentive for, for structural reforms. Um, now moving to, to the demand side, I agree I agree that there was a mismanagement of aggregate demand. If you look at the profile of uh, GDP growth uh, since, uh, to, since the start of the crisis, uh, and you compare the EU area with the UK or the US, uh, those move in parallel in 2009, there is a plunge, and then a recovery in 2010 and 11, a rec and then there is a divergence, 2000, starting in 2012. And uh, in my view, there are three reasons for that, and the three are internal to the organization of the EU area. Uh, the first one is post-cyclical fiscal policy. So we had aggregate adjustments, and uh, I will come back to that. Um, the second one is very sad, actually. We have a deflationary bias in the EU area, like in, in the gold standard. So uh, it means that uh, we have not found the key out of this uh, calamity of the deflationary bias in a fixed exchange rate regime where only uh, deficit countries feel uh, uh, obliged to uh, adjust their wages and prices, so you have a deflationary bias. And the, the third one, of course, is the credit crunch in some countries and the uh, uh, risk premium, so the fall in investment. So this makes me think that something is wrong with uh, macroeconomic governance in the EU area, the way it is organized. And I think there are two uh, points here. The first one is that economic governance is organized mainly as a country by country, by country uh, on the country by country basis. Uh, if you think, if you look at uh, European, European Commission, publications, for instance, in their recommendations to the euro area. So there are recommendations to the euro area, but who is the euro area, you don't know. Uh, so people just don't look at that. But uh, in the, the recommendations to the euro area, it was written, for instance, in 2014, that those countries with um, a room for maneuver, a fiscal room for maneuver, should use it. And then in the recommendations on the country by country basis, this disappears. Those countries with some room of maneuver to, to uh, so fiscal room for maneuver or just demand room for maneuver, ability to restart demand in current, when the current account is positive, uh, you don't find these uh, recommendations on a country by country basis. So if you add up the country by country recommendations, you, you don't recover the EU area recommendations. So it's mainly a country by country analysis uh, or process. And the second problem is uh, the fact that, 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 in my view, there's the excessive focus on fiscal sustainability. Fiscal sustainability is very important indeed uh, to protect the ECB, uh, for, uh, to protect the independence of the ECB as we see today. So it, it's, it's one very important channel of spillovers within a, within a monetary union. But it's not the only one. Fiscal policy is not only something about fiscal sustainability. It's also demand management. And this was dropped from uh, the surveillance. Uh, and uh, we have, uh, if you look at uh, member states in 2007, only one actually had a fiscal deficit in excess of 3% of GDP, and we didn't know that at that time. It was Greece. 
the other ones uh, were below 3% of GDP. However, if you move to the current account, which is a sum of the, fisc of the fiscal account and the private uh, excess, uh, excess savings, uh, you see that all countries with uh, deficits in excess of 4% of GDP had problems during the crisis. So we had the wrong, uh, the wrong uh, thermometer. Uh, we should have, so we recognize that with the six pack and the extension of surveillance to other issues, but still we, we have this, imbal this uh, imbalance between the private and uh, public surveillance, because at the same time where we were introducing the macroeconomic imbalance procedure, at the same time we were strengthening the SGP. So uh, today uh, the MIP, the so-called MIP, the macroeconomic imbalance procedure, which would be the the, the main, should be the main instrument for macroeconomic uh, coordination. Uh, it is weak. It is weak for several reasons. One of them is it's too large. It embodies many issues. For instance, if you look uh, at the recommendations for Italy under this procedure, uh, it was uh, suggested to uh, reform the, um, to improve the school, school outcomes, to simplify the re regulatory environment, to invest in energy, energy infrastructure, to uh, enhance port management. So these probably are very good uh, recommendations, but if Italy were not in the monetary union, I think uh, the recommendation would be the same. So are, these are not specific to the monetary union. In my view, we should streamline this procedure and concentrate on what is really key for the monetary union, and what is really key is uh, all fiscal imbalances, yes, but also of uh, imbalances in the private sector, and also uh, competitiveness, the drift in, uh, in uh, relative prices and uh, relative uh, uh, unit labor costs. So I think we, sh we need urgently to rebalance the surveillance and put macroeconomic surveillance at the core, but a streamlined macroeconomic surveillance, not to burden it with all issues uh, that concern all the European Union, not, not only the monetary union, but also uh, other countries. Thank you. Thank you. And coming back, Guido, to what you mentioned about aggregated demand, that, however, again, it's a, an unsolved issue. Or don't you think that, however, factors very relevant, like unemployment rate, which is, however, very different accordingly with the different countries, plus the issue of aging of population and the issue of immigration are honestly modifying, in a certain sense, the DNA of the concept of aggregated demand within Europe. And if I compare Europe, seeing Europe from outside, comparing to other countries like US or again China or India, sound honestly very, very different. However, are elements that you have to consider on the table to, to manage the concept of aggregated demand. Uh, obviously, there are heterogeneities and they are important. Uh, but I think it's difficult to dispute the fact that during the recent period there was a lack of aggregate demand. Uh, the, uh, Euro, uh, the Euro area has been running a, a current account surplus throughout uh, the, this period, which is still very large, and uh, in Germany it's uh, huge. Uh, the inflation rate is negative. The unemployment rate is very high. So uh, all of this suggests that uh, obviously there is uh, an, a lack of aggregate demand at the level of the euro area. And uh, um, although there are heterogeneities, we know very well how to stimulate aggregate demand with monetary policy, as we are seeing now, uh, and with fiscal policy. So despite the heterogeneity, I think uh, the tools uh, uh, for uh, achieving uh, a, a higher aggregate demand exist, and, and governments know how to use them. I think the reason why they were not used uh, is not uh, the heterogeneity, but uh, as Agnès was suggesting, the fact that uh, uh, the institutions uh, have, uh, that we have in place uh, essentially create uh, a tool for aggregate demand for monetary policy, and for the rest, they uh, either constrain fiscal policy by means of rules, or rely on coordination, but coordination is uh, ineffective. Uh, 
uh, I think, to achieve something which maybe is not necessarily in the natural interests uh, of, the, of the individual countries. Coordination can work as in uh, the case of fiscal rules when it is very simple and prevent countries from running into deficit. In that case, uh, some kind of uh, common policy can be imposed. Uh, I am more skeptical that you can achieve uh, effective coordination uh, without an effective transfer of authorities, where we see uh, a European policy which works effectively is in the areas in which there has been an effective transfer of sovereignty, like in banking supervision now, in monetary policy, in competition policy, in trade policy. And uh, I am afraid that, uh, and here perhaps I disagree slightly with Agnès, uh, that although what she uh, uh, suggests and makes uh, a lot of sense and is convincing, it is still going to be vastly inadequate uh, if the, our goal is to correct uh, this uh, systematic bias that she mentions that doesn't allow us to have ad adequate aggregate demand in uh, situations of crisis. And to achieve that, uh, I think we should uh, uh, acknowledge the fact that we have created a monetary union and having created a monetary union, we need to have some kind of fiscal infrastructure to support the monetary union. Uh, and uh, unless we uh, go in that direction, uh, we will uh, uh, not be able to remedy uh, these difficulties. And again, I am struck by how this point was acknowledged in the report written by uh, the four presidents in 2012, and how instead the new analytical note that was presented uh, in February of this year uh, uh, this issue of uh, creating a fiscal infrastructure for our monetary union is relegated to one small bullet point together with other 15. Uh, and uh, uh, of course, we are debating the Greek crisis and maybe we cannot talk about risk sharing and fiscal infrastructures at this moment in time, but nevertheless, uh, these problems will, will resurface, we should not be over optimistic because now we are seeing glimpses of growth. We have an incomplete uh, institutional setting and we should uh, work hard to complete it. Coming back to, to, to this aspect, in, in Europe, however, we have uh, a stakeholder in a certain sense with voting rights. So citizens that are uh, sending signals to European Union, on one end in a very emotional way, on the other end, uh, reacting to the management of the dilemma between uh, austerity and uh, expansion. H how do you see any, the story in terms also impact on the future architecture of Europe? Uh, okay, so I think yeah, we should recognize that uh, the monetary union today doesn't work. And there are two ways uh, then, uh, either to destroy everything or to move forward. And uh, we should uh, be very open uh, to the discussion on uh, destroying everything uh, why sh and explain why, well, in my view, we should not go in, in, in that direction. But this is not obvious for the citizen. So we need to explain this openly to them and not say there is only one way. Yes, there is another way. Uh, but we, we, we wouldn't like to, to, to follow it. Uh, about aggregate demand, I think 2015 and the coming months actually will be very interesting test because we are experiencing a positive demand shock uh, through the, the fall in the oil price, which in our case for the euro area at least increases the purchasing power, it's a positive shock on the purchasing power of consumers and also the fall of the euro. And uh, if uh, growth doesn't resume in the coming months, then <laughs> it will mean that definitely it was a supply side problem, not a demand side problem. Uh, about uh, sovereignty, um, I think that um, for, a problem we had uh, in, in the previous uh, years was uh, the, um, the inconsistency between fiscal rules at the European level and fiscal rules at the national level. Namely, the fiscal break introduced uh, in Germany uh, means that uh, there was, well, the problem we have in Europe is that we have a minimum speed for fiscal adjustment, but we don't have a, f a maximum speed f for fiscal adjustment. And uh, the, the main country which had the possibility to pace down uh, the fiscal adjustment didn't 
uh, choose that. So it's a major failure of coordination, and it means probably it means that uh, we should not introduce fiscal rules that are inconsistent with the European, between the European level and the national level. Uh, about the future of the architecture, so there's less disagreement uh, between Guido and myself uh, than wh what, you, what he says. I, I agree that coordination is uh, very difficult and it's not natural for governments because basically you ask each government to take into account the spillovers of its decisions on other countries, so to, to move away from the uh, preference of, their, of its citizens, uh, which is uh, inconsistent with national sovereignty. Um, so coordination is very fragile. We see it at the global level with the G20. The G20 always uh, fails to, uh, to organize some macroeconomic uh, uh, coordination. And it's also the case at the EU area level. And in one sense, uh, the monetary union is, was a way to get out of this difficulty. During several decades, we tried monetary coordination through the European snake and then the European monetary system. And we had several crises, so it was decided to move for integration. Same for banking union. For several years, we tried to coordinate banking supervision, and it lamentably failed. So we moved to uh, the banking union. So then the question is, what is the next victim? And uh, I agree that uh, there is a case for fiscal union. Uh, the problem is that it has not been defined correctly so far, because you, you can have different visions of, of, it, of a fiscal union. It can be a, a European budget to complement ECB's action, so to uh, deliver uh, counter-cyclical aggregate fiscal policy. Um, so this would need a borrowing capacity, because we are talking about a budget of, of like 2% of GDP. In the US, it's 20%, so <laughs> we are lacking one zero. And uh, if you don't have the capacity to borrow, then just forget about counter-cyclical policy. So borrowing capacity means own resource, means uh, a, a different uh, fiscal, uh, a different political organization. So it's very far-reaching. You have a different concept, which is just risk sharing. So, it, and this was in the report of uh, the pre four presidents. So the idea was uh, to uh, have a budget that is uh, always uh, balanced. Uh, so you don't have this problem of uh, euro bonds and fiscal uh, and, and tax uh, resource. Uh, and you have tra uh, transfers between, so temporary transfers between uh, European members, depending on uh, uh, idiosyncratic shocks. So it's a kind of mutual uh, insurance, macroeconomic insurance between uh, member states. The problem is that you need to organize that behind the veil of ignorance. And today, we are not behind the veil of ignorance. So there is a lot of uh, mistrust between countries. And you have a third uh, concept of uh, budget, which is uh, pro-growth investment. Uh, you want to invest in areas with high externalities uh, between member states. And if you look at the Juncker plan, initially, it was presented as a counter-cyclical uh, buffer for the, for the euro area. And then, uh, because it was decided to, be, to, to, to build it in a very uh, strict way and to, uh, to screen all the projects, uh, to screen their governance, to screen the return, to screen the private-public uh, involvement, uh, then it has not yet started, and it will start when growth recovers. So it's clearly not a counter-cyclical policy. It's more an a pro-growth investment policy. So uh, with a 20% of GDP uh, budget, you can do everything at the same time. With 2%, probably you cannot. And you have to choose. And this debate has not started yet. So <clears throat> I think we should uh, uh, restart this discussion. And in my view, it's a way to save the SGP, the Stability and Growth Pact, because once you have, if, if you can deliver on counter-cyclical policy at the eurozone level, then you can be much tougher at the, at the state level because uh, there is no, like in a federal country where, where the states individually need to be balanced at any time and counter cyclical policy is, taken, uh, it is uh, uh, taken care of at the federal level. So I think we need to, to and uh, we, we could also talk about labor market uh, reforms and the way, for instance, you can link 
labor market harmonization and reform to the introduction of uh, macroeconomic uh, insurance through a uh, euro area level unemployment scheme where you could say to countries, if you deliver on a number of standards of the labor market, then you will get access to this uh, unemployment scheme at the European level. And this would be a positive incentive rather than a negative incentive where you, uh, you impose uh, sanctions to countries that don't deliver on the reforms. It would be better to offer them a new layer of European solidarity if they deliver on the reforms. Uh, just a last issue before leaving room to questions. Uh, you mentioned before uh, quantitative easing, so the, the issue of liquidity, however, it's uh, embedded within uh, uh, these this, this debates. What is your idea, your uh, positioning, considering uh, the issue of the amount of liquidity, which is driven by European Central Bank, but also is driven by the big amount of money that investors and big funds are putting on the table, especially on uh, peripheral countries in this moment in, in Europe. Don't you think that could be a support to, to growth or this big amount of liquidity in a certain sense is stopped by the increasing of uh, regulatory framework within the banking system that at the end of the day, it's really the bridge between the European Central Bank and the final users in the system? Uh, should I start? So uh, I think uh, there are uh, pros and cons uh, uh, of, of uh, uh, the views that I'm expressing. I guess one reason to think that QE will be a very powerful force, maybe more powerful than uh, it was in uh, uh, the US or the UK, uh, is that uh, QE in the Euro area takes place in an environment of negative interest rates, where negative interest rate means the liquidity is very expensive. Uh, and so this is a hot potato theory of liquidity. The central bank puts more liquidity into the market. Nobody wants it. And so it has to pass it on to someone else, like a hot potato. Uh, and this increases the effectiveness of QE and maybe uh, should be more effective than uh, we uh, were used to thinking uh, uh, when we look at the experience of other countries. And I guess the uh, reaction of financial markets uh, so far is consistent with this hot, hot potato theory of liquidity in the euro area. Uh, on the other hand, however, uh, the real, it's not obvious that uh, this uh, liquidity is increasing uh, the spending power in the, in the real economy because there are other hurdles uh, uh, that are perhaps more relevant in the euro area than in other parts of the world. One is the lack of capital of the banking system. Uh, a second is the fact that uh, much of trade is internal to the euro area. Of course, not all of it, but an important component of trade is internal to the euro area. So the exchange rate depreciation is not so as effective as it, as it could be if we were more open. Uh, and, and finally, uh, there is still probably lack of demand for credit in uh, 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 the real economy, and finally the banking sector, uh, of course, is more important than capital markets, and so these portfolio effects have less leverage in uh, the euro area. So uh, I think in the end my view is that QE will be important and it will uh, increase uh, growth, and I share uh, the predictions that uh, uh, official institutions uh, have uh, made. The Bank of Italy, I think, argues that uh, because of QE, uh, growth in Italy over the next two years will be one, about 1% higher, which seems a, a sensible number. I think the risk is, uh, however, that uh, uh, all the uh, financial effects of QE resulting from the hot potato aspect uh, will create uh, uh, risks of uh, uh, bubbles or divergences between uh, financial markets uh, and, and real activity. Of course, this hasn't taken place, uh, but it is uh, something to be aware of, and it brings us back uh, to uh, the previous point that we should not overburden monetary policy, uh, and we should uh, uh, also think of fiscal policy, because one important implication of QE, and that's perhaps the last thing I want to say on this, uh, that maybe is neglected in public discussion is that 
QE relaxes also the government budget constraint. Uh, essentially, in the case of Italy, uh, QE will mean that all the new debt is net debt issued by the Italian government will be bought by uh, uh, the ECB or the Bank of Italy uh, as a result of QE during the current year. So there will be no addition to government debt in the market and of course uh, this results uh, in uh, uh, lower interest spending and, and lower debt uh, in the market for years to the extent that this is a permanent expansion of uh, the central bank. So there is more room in uh, uh, the budget of the national governments and uh, that's another channel through which QE can lead to an expansion of aggregate demand because of course this room uh, will be used uh, but more could be used and it will be used. Thank you Guido. And yes on these aspects. Yeah. Um. So uh, QE has been criticized uh, because it was taking place where, and at a period where Rich Premier had already disappeared in the euro area and uh, in contradict. So this uh, is a difference uh, compared to the US. And also uh, now we see that credit growth is uh, normalizing in the euro area. Uh, so nevertheless, I, so I think the main channels of QE will be uh, through inflation expectations and through uh, the exchange rate. And uh, the, the, what are the risks? Uh, obviously, there is a big risk for financial stability, so it is going to be a, a, a big test for macroprudential policy. And it introduces a, a big distortions because basically you have a big player, uh, which will uh, a big buyer of bonds, and on the other side, uh, the banks and insurance companies are constrained by liquidity and uh, capital requirements, so they don't want to sell too much. Uh, so then, uh, who will be the sellers who will move to, to, to more risky investments? These will be institutions out of uh, the perimeter of uh, strong surveillance. So it means that you will have increased risk in the system and the, the uh, publications of the BIS uh, are quite uh, uh, a concern today. So I, I think we should double our uh, awareness about fi uh, financial stability and don't hesitate to introduce some macroprudential uh, policy instruments in the coming months. Thank you, Ines. I think that we have the last 15 minutes. Uh, it's, uh, incredible opportunity uh, for a Q&A session coming from the audience for Guido and Agnès. We have a microphone over there. That's the first question. Uh, good morning, Fabio Scirpa from Geneva. Um, I would like to challenge the definition of our conference, this part of the conference, because I reconnect with two words very interesting that have been mentioned by our guests, coordination and solidarity. I think that no one in their right mind would prefer austerity over growth. What we're talking about here is really um, national interest against uh, shared destiny. And I think this way of representing this reality would also help citizens to understand what we're talking about at this level, when uh, conferences and uh, people in power uh, are discussing all that in their own interest, I mean, in the interest of of the countries and the citizens of the countries. We shouldn't forget that in the past of centuries, these imbalances would result in a war between nations. And what we're doing and what we're discussing about today shows us the big evolution we have been able to create. And it's not by chance that the institutions that we're talking about were created after the Second World War to make sure that humanity and Europe in particular would not fall into that trap again. So it's not really a question, it's a challenge to rephrase the old construction of these discussions because otherwise it becomes dif difficult for everyday people also to understand why everybody again should point in one direction and no one should really be confronted with the choice between growth and austerity because the, in this case the answer is very simple. Thank you. Thanks. Let's collect other questions and a reply from Guido and Agnès. A question there. Hello. Hi. It's Michele Troiani. I work at the London Stock Exchange. 
uh, and uh, I'm a proud uh, Bocconi alumni, graduating in 2001. Uh, my question is really straight. What do you think of the Greek election and uh, what do you think in the coming weeks will be the reaction of, let's say, the Germans? And uh, do you think there is a space, uh, especially with the weaker Euro, with uh, DAX and Germany performing very well of the softening of their attitude. Thank you. Thank you so much. A question there. Uh, hello, Shifar Halberstadt, class of 2014. I have a brief question. Um, I would like to know what you think are the most important factors that prevented the countries with more fiscal space early on in the crisis to invest in infrastructure or energy or similar in the countries that were forced into austerity. Thank you. Thank you. A last question before the round of Professor Monti. Uh, we have uh, two distinguished economists here, one from France, one from Italy, and both deeply, and both deeply uh, Europeans. Uh, would they care to say a few words on how each of them sees the other country in relation to uh, economic policy making in the context of the Eurozone and in relation to the evolution in the respective public opinions. Should I repeat? <laughs> no, no, I see Agnès a bit perplexed. Is, is the question clear? Okay. It so, what, what do you think of Italy, basically? <laughs> a, a very last question there. A very last question. Thank you. Thank you. Guido Picchisau. Just a question about the fiscal uh, union. Uh, to what extent the problem of the fiscal union is related to the mechanics through which resources are distributed, and I am referring to the structure of funds, where the regionalization of these funds uh, are um, avoiding to focus the allocation of the funds to where the investments are mostly needed. Thank you. Okay, so I think we have 10 minutes to give answers to all the problems of the world, so that's great, <laughs> and you can start, I think. Uh, should I start? Uh, so let me take them uh, in more or less in the order in which they came. Uh, on, on the first <coughs> remark, it was not a question, uh, I agree very much with what, what was said, uh, but let me wear the hat, so I w wore the hat of the passionate European, let me wear the hat of the, uh, now the analyst, uh, and ask myself, uh, is it going to happen? Uh, and here, unfortunately, I'm uh, more pessimistic and more skeptical, because if I look at the history of countries that united in a meaningful way, they did so uh, generally under an external threat. Uh, and unless Russia creates surprises, there is no external threat here now. We are making arguments in favor of unification due to our um, economic interests, and I wonder whether that is uh, enough. Uh, of course, there is the ideal, uh, but uh, without the external threat, uh, at least history suggests that it is not going to happen. And of course, public opinion in uh, many of these countries uh, uh, has a lot of mistrust. And unfortunately, the crisis deepened the mistrust also because created bigger conflicts of interest because now we have the legacy of these uh, high debts and these very divergent situations. So it will be politically very challenging and uh, as an analyst, if I am to bet that this will happen, probably I will have to take a negative bet. Uh, on, on Greece uh, and, and what will happen, I think Greece, in my view, is very different from the rest of the European countries. Uh, I imagine that, uh, uh, so uh, hopefully uh, the drama in Greece will not uh, reverberate too much in the rest of Europe, uh, 
uh, I imagine it will not go away soon. Uh, I really hope that there will not be an accident. I think it will be a disaster for Greece and for Europe if, if it were. And if Greece remains in the euro area, I think we will continue this uh, very difficult and tiring negotiations uh, uh, probably for years, not for months, because the situation will not, will not change uh, uh, very quickly. Uh, so I think for Greece, more of the same is my prediction. Uh, and the concern is that the Greece is very strapped for cash, of course. And so uh, we have to make sure that accidents don't happen because Greece runs uh, uh, out of cash. Uh, why investments were not made in Southern Europe? I think probably because uh, there were uh, priorities at the time due to the sudden stop, which was to fix uh, uh, the budgetary situation. So where investment should have been made, in my opinion, at the time was in Northern Europe, uh, where a more expansionary fiscal policy should have taken place. I don't think Southern Europe during, during the crisis had uh, much of an option. Uh, and my view is that uh, if you want to stimulate aggregate demand in Southern Europe, probably you ought to do so through tax rebates and maybe through fiscal devaluations to help Southern Europe regain the competitiveness that it has lost rather than uh, through public investment. Uh, on uh, Mario's question, I am really not an expert of France. I I think Mario was probably more interested in the view of Agnès about Italy. <laughs> but uh, I will try to answer, subject to the big constraint of my lack of knowledge. Uh, probably my prejudice uh, is that France, and maybe this is what Mario wanted me to articulate, is that France is having a very hard time enacting the supply side reforms that are badly needed for France. Uh, I don't understand very well why. Uh, maybe because the political leadership now is uh, divided and it's uh, uh, not following through the aspiration of the country. I imagine that uh, the supply side distortions that are so important in France are evident uh, to uh, many, many of the French uh, citizens. Uh, I am concerned, however, that France too, uh, not the elite, but um, a lot of public opinion in France, uh, is skeptical that the European Union uh, would uh, call for more integration. And so this uh, reinforces my view of France, my skepticism that uh, we are really ready to uh, uh, build the institutions that uh, Europe needs. Uh, on uh, uh, the last issue uh, of uh, uh, the structural funds, let me just say that uh, the structural funds, in my opinion, maybe this was what the speaker had in mind, I'm not sure I understood, are an example of how you should not use the European uh, budget uh, because you are forcing countries to contribute to the European Union, then you give them back money. Uh, in the case of my own country, much of this money is wasted or is not spent effectively, or it even uh, breeds corruption. I think it would be much more effective to use these structural funds in other ways, including allowing Italy to gain more competitiveness through uh, rebates uh, in uh, tax distortions and in labor taxes, rather than in uh, structural funds. Uh, uh, so that's an example of a problem that uh, we have, not of an opportunity of how to use a fiscal union. Thank you, Guido. And yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, I will try to cover also the, all the questions. So uh, on the first question, uh, I think what is important today in the very short term is uh, to preserve uh, some uh, room for the um, uh, expression of sovereignty at national level. You, you cannot uh, coordinate everything. Uh, you can discuss growth enhancing policies, but basically these are national uh, sovereignty. And uh, we should, as I said, concentrate coordination on what is really key to the functioning of the monetary union and express recommendations in terms of intermediate objectives rather than instruments. Say a country to a country, you should uh, adjust your unit labor costs in Europe terms by X percent, rather than say, you should move social contribution in that way and that way and, and uh, 
and introduce uh, internal devaluation, physical devaluation, which is, we know uh, in, if everyone does the same, it will be inefficient. So I, I think uh, we should revise the way uh, the coordination is uh, devised. And that's true that there is a lot of mistrust uh, among the citizens, but also it's uh, endogenous because uh, the only great project that was offered to the citizens in the last couple of years was the banking union. I think it's very important to have the banking union, but people think that it is another way to give money to the, to the banks. Uh, whereas it's just the opposite, but it's impossible to, to, to explain that. So we, we will lack some uh, positive uh, projects. Uh, we should also rely on the youth, and there are many things that can be done for the youth, and these things uh, don't move fast enough. Uh, about the Greek election um, uh, and, uh, and the, the evolution of the debate on, on the Greek case, I think that, um, well, in a rational, there is no rationality uh, for Greece to leave the euro area today, and especially since, in, in fact, wage adjustment, re, uh, unit labor cost adjustment has taken place. So there is not really uh, uh, an interest for, for Greece to, to, to have a devaluation. All, what is important for Greece is uh, to, uh, to work on tax collection, of course, and also to, to reform market structures. During the crisis, you've seen a, a fall in wages, and prices have uh, remained stable. So there is really a, a problem of competition in Greece, and this is both a problem for, for, the, for the poor, because they, of course, obviously they, they, they lost their purchasing power. It's also a problem for competitive, competitiveness. And uh, normally, and this uh, links uh, to the investment issue, normally uh, there's a point where investment should resume. And why doesn't investment resume is because we have this uncertainty uh, about the status of Greece in the, in the monetary union and wh what's going to happen. So uh, I think that the, each month of uncertainty uh, is detrimental also for, for, for this reason. Um, so, okay, and if, if in the event which I think still has a low probability, but uh, significant probability. In the event uh, Greece would leave the EU, the EU area, would, we would need urgently to have another project of integration to, to show that uh, the EU area is moving forward, uh, because otherwise there is a, really a risk of uh, contagion. Um, uh, and about investment again, um, in, in the north, uh, or in Germany, there is a, a big debate on uh, the need for investment. Many people are not convinced that there is a need for more investment. They, it is the thing that uh, investment should come down when you have accumulated sufficient capital and due to demographic uh, reasons and things like that. Or that, the, and this is the same in, in fact, that the return, the marginal return on investment is very low, so they should not invest. Um, and uh, I think that uh, it would be more fruitful to put uh, the debate in, to, 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 to put this case in, in another way, and uh, to say that in Germany uh, the, uh, the traded goods sector is very much developed, and the non-traded goods sector has not developed at the same pace. Whereas in Italy and France, and this is something in common with, between Italy and France, that we've seen a development of the non-traded non -traded goods sector, so services, uh, basically, as compared to uh, the traded goods sectors. And also in Spain and in Ireland, this movement has reversed since the start of the crisis. It has not started in Italy and France. And I think this is a big challenge for our two countries. Uh, in Germany, it's the opposite. There is a, a bit hypertrophy of the um, uh, traded goods sector, and uh, we should work on how to develop the non-traded goods sector to move resources from the traded goods sector to the non-traded goods sector, and this will reduce the current account by boosting internal demand. So um, I think this is a more, uh, uh, a more consensual way to, to, to put the debate. Um, about uh, the alternative policies in, uh, in Italy and France, so I always uh, already 
touched about uh, traded goods sectors. Um, I, I think in France it's very strange because the opinion is in, in favor of reforms. When you, when you ask the people whether they like the supply side reforms, they say yes, basically. And uh, the parliament says no. So there's a pr problem of representation and this feeds uh, a re a resentment and uh, we will have election uh, on Sunday and it's going to be a disaster. Uh, so um, I think um, I, I think the there is a need for, for the politicians to move forward and to move closer to the population, to understand better the needs, uh, and uh, also to... Un I don't know how to do it, because uh, if you take the median representative in Parliament, he is the mayor of a small town where the first employer is a hospital. He's never seen uh, an international, international uh, company. And so he has no idea of international competition and the European debate and nothing. So it's also very narrow-minded. I don't know how to, to, to change this. What I wanted to say uh, about uh, coordination is that there is a lot of focus on fiscal adjustment in, in France, obviously. And I think 2015 will be interesting because if growth is higher than forecasted, then the European partners need to be very tough on France to do more. Uh, rather than uh, less. Um, but uh, also, uh, for instance, since the start of the crisis, the unit labor cost in France has grown up, it means that real wages uh, have grown more rapidly than productivity, which uh, basically is uh, flat. And I think this is much more a con should be much more a concern than fiscal adjustment. There should be much more focus on this because the big problem of the French economy is the, the, the fall, steady fall in uh, market shares, uh, global market shares. And this is much more important than uh, looking at whether we should adjust 0.2% uh, more than uh, the, the government. So I think the deal, there, there can be a good deal between uh, well, stable, uh, not so much uh, fiscal adjustment, but much more on uh, supply side reforms, and especially reforms of the labor market, and the way wages are set, and uh, how to break this, because uh, this is much more concern in my view. So I will not comment on the Italian uh, economy, which I obviously uh, know not so much. Um, Thank you. Thank you very much. So Stefano Donati is waiting for the coffee, I suppose. So thank you very much.